Let's read together the 84th Psalm. We're reading it in the uh, New Living Translation here. Read it with me. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar, O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God. What joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessing. They will continue to grow stronger and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O oh Lord, God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand else or anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, last week, I read an interesting article in the New York Times that I wanted to tell you about. It was a group of social scientists that conducted an experiment in which they, they gathered uh, 50 men and 50 women, none of whom had met one another before, and then they, they uh, divided them into couples, um, and so, uh, and, and man and a woman, and so you had, you had these 50 couples, and then they had them to read uh, 30 questions and record the answer that the other one gave, and then, the, then they would reverse the order. So uh, each one asked 30 questions of the other and then recorded the answers. The questions began very general, you know, how do you feel about how the day and, or uh, how's life going for you, those kind of things. And then they, they consistently got more uh, intimate. And finally, after this was two hour, a two-hour exercise, and the end of the exercise, they were to stare into one another's eyes for uh, four minutes. Two, a, a year, before a year had passed, two of these couples had gotten married, and all of them recorded having felt fond affection for the people with whom they went through this exercise. And the purpose of this study was to figure out how people fall in love. And I thought this thing was full of implications. It was a, it's a great, great article. Uh, and uh, I, I begin to think about it. Um, it's, uh, I would hazard a guess that many of those people that conducted this experiment had never before in their life felt utterly heard by someone else. They had never experienced that degree of intimacy with anyone. And I dare say that that would be true of the people in this room as well, married and unmarried. We tend, to, we hunger for intimacy, but we also uh, do all kinds of things uh, to subvert intimacy. I was just noticing this. I'd read the article and I began to notice uh, in my, my, all my family were in, uh, and I have a three-year-old grandson I mean, three-month-old uh, three grandson, a big difference there. And I just noticed, I mean, he's beginning now, he, he, he would try to uh, uh, follow when a, a voice, when he hears a voice, he tries to find out, he's still trying to move his head, it's still not quite uh, 
uh, yet uh, he hasn't mastered how, how to move his head, but he tries to find the voice. And I noticed that when an adult would, would go over and just look in his face, he would sometimes actually tremble, uh, and his whole face just kind of disappeared uh, in a grin. We like to be seen. We like to be noticed. And even at three months old, my grandson wants to be a part of the family in the way that he understands. Is it any wonder that we, uh, uh, most of us will experience the most uh, intimate feelings in life uh, for our mother? A mother spends so much time with that child, looking into the child's face, uh, encouraging the child when they make uh, some noise that begins to sound like approximating uh, mama or dad or whatever. And uh, it doesn't have to, I mean, no one else can actually hear that they're getting close to that. The mother will hear and it's like, oh, that's a good boy. And he's like, oh, and he'll say it again, right? And also when toilet training comes, uh, encouragement is, is a really wonderful thing. And also these days you can pay them. Uh, we, we hunger to be seen. And, uh, and it's, uh, we go through life longing to have someone to hear us and to see us as we are. Our dreams, our ambitions, our fears, our, our, our apprehensions. Um, we, we, we both hide those things from others, but we also want them to know who we are and to not go away uh, when they find out who we are. A lot of us, uh, we spin a kind of a personality we construct, and people may like that, but we're not satisfied because we know they really are not seeing us. They're seeing come some construction we're putting on for them, and we know that if, or we believe that if we showed ourselves as we are, we would not be loved. And this is, this is really a problem in life. I read a, um, a study, I mean an essay actually, by this mother who was an uh, English professor. And she had two sons, and one of them had gone into the same profession. He was also an English professor. And so, of course, they had a lot in common, and, and they exchanged a lot of uh, communications about books and things like that. And the other son uh, went into business of selling John Deere tractors. And this was more of a problem, more of a stretch. And this mother decided, when she saw her son in school even, began to take a different track, a vocational track that was different than her other son. She determined she was going to stay connected to her son. And she ended up uh, subscribing to trade magazines of John Deere tractors, knowing all the models, uh, the different things, the things that were coming out, so that she would be able to enter her son's world and talk to him to the extent then he would call her sometime and say, I'm thinking about running this new line, Mom. What do you think? Have you read, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. And she said this was really, really hard for her because she had no interest in it whatsoever. She had to cultivate an interest and in going to the trade shows and so forth because she did not want to lose the connection with her son. That is attention. Family attention forms the child. And uh, at first, for a long time, the child has no real personal interest. The child honors what we honor. It celebrates what we honor, beginning with the language itself. Uh, you know, if, if you're an English-speaking family, your child is not going to speak Chinese. Uh, that's not going to happen unless they learn it later on or they're around some folks and you encourage it. But uh, many times uh, a problem, a child... Uh, will only speak the language of, of its family uh, their whole life, and it's a block in language learning later on because it feels somehow wrong for us to repeat st sounds that we did not learn in childhood and to say it like other people say. That's not the way things are, are done. I don't know about you, but I can remember as a child, both parents and teachers sometimes talking to me and it was kind of like Charlie Brown and the Charlie Brown adults were like, wah, 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 wah. And then all of a sudden, a, a piercing question that I did understand would come out, are you paying attention to me? And the answer was always, yes, I am. 
But then the terror that they might say, then what did I just say? Because you don't know, right? Uh, it's kind of like the child in the children's sermon, the, ch- the, the children's pastor giving the, ch- the children's sermon in the service. And so the you know, little children around, and so the children's pastor said, and so little girls and boys, uh, what, what is green and sits on a lily pad and says, rivet, rivet, rivet? And this kid says, ugh. I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus, but it sounds just like a frog. (laughs) Most of our conversations with one another are really monologues going on simultaneously. Someone is speaking while we begin to form our response. We don't hear. Our mind is full of stuff, like a room and... uh, you know, this, this room, and I've often used that when I was uh, working in the therapeutic world, to say your mind is like a room and it's full of stuff. Uh, you don't know what's all in your mind because you hardly ever look at the other stuff. Your focus is on your line of sight. You can only see what's in your line of sight. I have this feeling that there's people behind me. It's a persistent feeling, but I don't see them right now. But if I do see them, oh, there they are, but now I no longer see you. And this is what many times, you know, where our minds are not always in the same place as our bodies. Uh, Our minds can be elsewhere. The undisciplined mind wonders at a sound or a color or a word uh, that begins to provoke some memory or an emotion and takes us down a train of thought until something else grabs our attention and we go that way. That's why we use the term pay attention because uh, real focused attention costs us. It costs us in energy and time. An entertaining movie or an advertisement, we don't have to pay attention. The producer of those things are gifted at capturing our attention with big noise or bizarre action or something. A gun goes off, something. You know, and that's why in modern movies, uh, more and more you, you're watching and all of a sudden, you know, somebody naked walks by. And you're just like, what's that got to do with the story? No, but you got your attention right. Uh, you'd think human beings, so they've seen one example of uh, each of the two varieties available that it wouldn't capture our attention, but it, it does. And, uh, and so, every, you know, the producer knows this. And so they capture our attention with these, with these kinds of things. A fun novel can do that as well, but serious literature... Serious literature requires attention to plot and character development and symbols and so forth, and great works can be read many times, but unfortunately, most people, they don't feel like that they they want to give that time because they want something that will keep capturing their attention rather than to develop the ability to pay attention. And we have this in church. Praise courses, for example, capture our attention Uh, And that's what they're for. And they capture the attention of our heart. You know, when, oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. We begin to sing that, and we, we can learn the words very quickly, and we can sing it several times, and it captures our attention. But a hymn requires a much more focused attention on the message. Like uh, in in the song... uh, um, that um, um, come thou fount of every blessing. There is a verse that almost no one sings anymore because it starts off with, here I raise my Ebenezer. And it's like, what? (laughs) Well, Robert Robinson wrote that in 1758 at a time when he knew that all worshipers would understand the reference was that when Israel had retaken the Ark of the Covenant, the prophet Samuel put up a large stone so that they could remember that God had been with them to capture that. And he called the stone Ebenezer, the stone of help, which of course stands for the God of Israel that is the rock of the nation. And see, 
we, th that's the re reference, and what, what, what Robinson wanted us to do was to think about our own victories, that we, we can look back and we see many victories in our life when God has intervened, and, and so we, we, we raise a monument to that, and it's to develop gratitude. Come thou fount of every blessing. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hitherto by grace I've come. And uh, so he had, he had no thought that there would come a time when Christians would be singing, uh, uh, would not be able to understand the, the lyrics because they didn't have that amount of biblical knowledge. So we talk about these things like, well, we can't expect us to, to really have that. We, our lives are so full, we can't really ex be expected to have that level of knowledge anymore. But think about it. I, I guarantee you that lots of people here know what the, uh, what the poll numbers are right now uh, in, in the uh, ongoing presidential election. Or you know sports scores. The fact is we decide where our attention is to go. And the reason that we can't sing many of these hymns anymore is because we have decided that uh, what captured our ancestors' attention is not worthy of ours. When we open up the 84th Psalm, David begins with this song of praise. How lovely is your tabernacle. He is deliberately arousing his own attention by praise. Praise does that. He goes on to say, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy for the living God. And what this tells us is that spiritual life does not just happen. It must be deliberately cultivated. It develops if we pay attention to it. But praise will not do that on its own. David goes on and he makes a decision to form a habit of going to God's house, to form a habit. And he says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. It's Sunday morning, it's time to go to church. Other things capture our attention or wish to, but we go to church. There might be something interesting on television, but we go to church. There may be a ball game, but we go to God's house. That's what believers do. And it's not about shaming you like you've done something terribly wrong if you, you know, go to a ball game occasionally. And I know people say, oh, you know, it's, it, God doesn't mind. Well, it's not about God minding. It's about where you're going to place your affections. Where are you going to place your affections? You have a decision to make. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. And then he goes deeper and says uh, that he blesses those who go on pilgrimages, uh, who gain their strength in the Lord, and they, they cultivate it by this particular method of piety, by going on a pilgrimage. There's something about when we go to a place where significant things have happened or significant people have lived, it can stir great emotions. A few years ago, I was with a church group, and we went uh, to Patmos, the island uh, where uh, John the Revelator received uh, the revelation uh, that is the last book of the Bible. And so... Well, we were in that uh, we were in that cave where uh, the early Christians say that John received this revelation. Uh, there was a, the tour guide read the opening uh, verses of the book of Revelation, and I found all of a sudden the emotion was too great to handle. It's like uh, it, it was it, it was not a tourist thing anymore for me. It was it, my piety was was stirred. Something went really really deep in me to where I didn't even want to talk too much about it. And uh, we we were on a, a a cruise ship, and so I got back there, and that evening I stayed up a good part of the night, and I read the book of Revelation, and the next day I began reading the Gospel of John, and then I read the epistles of John, and I, I, there was something I wanted to know this man a, a, a little bit more, the pilgrimage, and you know, it's, it's uh, a pilgrimage can even be going back to the place where you uh, first met the Lord, or going to a home place where family uh, taught you the things of God. There's all kinds of ways to do this, and pilgrimage is only uh, one way of doing that. And he goes on in this psalm to develop an attitude of expectancy. Something is happening to him, he confesses, because he walks this path with God. The Lord is a, is a, a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory and withhold nothing from those who walk uprightly. Something is happening to me as I walk this way 
of God. A new year is an opportunity to begin a new path. That's what we mean by New Year's resolutions. And so we decide, I'm going to be healthier. I'm going to only eat asparagus, you know, this year. Which, you know, we give up after the third day. Asparagus can only be fixed so many ways. We fall off the wagon with these. Then we want to learn a new skill. want to learn a new habit. want to give an old habit up. And we find out how difficult uh, that it can be. But these are good moments. These are the moments like of praise. When we say, yes. Praise is like, you know, when suddenly you notice that someone is attractive and you like them and you may tell them so. But... If it doesn't go any further than that, there's not going to be relationship. So many people now love praise and worship in the churches, and really what that means is singing praise courses for a long time and getting emotionally stirred. It's essential, but it's not sufficient. It is, it is a way of arousing the heart. It's saying... I like you, I like you, I like you, I like you, I like you a lot. Oh, thou, I like you. Um, But there comes a time when it's like, okay, and what shall you do about this new found like? Are you willing to change your life? Are you willing to change the way you speak? Are you willing to change your habits of life? Praise does not automatically develop godly habits. Praise praise is important, but it's not sufficient. Relationship becomes possible when we praise, but it does not automatically develop. Relationship with God is sustained by purposeful attention that we pay to God and to the things of God over the long haul. Let me give you some practical advice for this year. Why don't you start this year? We're, we- we're just a few days into the year with daily Bible reading and prayer. And I know that everybody here feel like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, I, I should do that. Here's the secret that no one is telling you. We all fall off the wagon with this a lot. You start and you fail to do it. You start again, you fail to do it. You start again, you go further. You start again, but then you get to the book of Leviticus. (laughs) You should take the fat and put it in the golden censer and then thou shalt take the ashes out therefore and thereof. And yea, it shall be unto you the feast that on the day of Ehob and Mahibasheth. And, and you're like, Ugh, I'm a bad person. <laughs> but you can talk to Jack over here, an elder of the church that walks with God and glows in the dark. And when I told him a few years ago I was studying the book of Leviticus, he said, Why? So you'll fall off the wagon a few times. Some things like the one-year Bible are really great. I use a method very similar to that for the Book of Common Prayer called the Daily Office. I read an Old Testament reading, a Gospel reading, a Psalm, and one of the epistles. And just a little short tidbits. And the thing about it is not like, got to get through the Bible. It's about reading until our heart is stirred. This is not serious Bible study, understanding what Aminoheb means or whatever. This is about reading until our heart is stirred. And, and often a word will begin to pop out or a, or a phrase or a sentence, and that's when you stop. You don't keep reading. You stop. And you say to the Lord, why is that moving me like it's moving me? And that's your manna for the day. There will be days that, you know, an hour later you will forget what you read that morning. But over time, you will notice that something begins to get into you that's important for your spiritual journey. 
Here's some more secrets I'm going to give you on this very first Sunday of the year. Churches do not feed you. Churches teach you how to feed yourself. Churches feed infants. The mature help feed the infants. So saying, hey, I don't go to that church anymore because it didn't feed me. It tells you your level of spiritual life. Churches do not have either good or bad worship. Churches have good or poor musicians. Hmm. And preachers. Some preachers are good communicators. Some are excellent communicators. Some are not so great. But some of the best communicators don't have that much to say. When you are gifted with the ability to communicate to an audience, you oftentimes do not have to think you have to study very much. And some of the greatest communicators are people that you walk away like, that was great. What did he say? <laughs> I remember hearing at one of the political conventions a few years ago, a very powerful speaker just brought the people to their feet again and again and again. And the commentator's like, whoa, whoa, that was an awesome speech. I've never heard anything. Have you ever heard anything like that, Jim? I have never heard anything like that, Jim. I've been covering political conventions for the last blah, blah years. I've never heard anything. That was absolutely astounding. And then someone said, what exactly was the essence of it? Well, it was like, uh, it was, uh, and then they began to laugh like, well, you know, there, it wasn't so much an essence. It was just like, but boy, it was stirring. And you know, really, there's just something about when there's a lot of energy on the platform, you'll get energy and it's like, whoa, oh, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what God is, oh, and you know, you'll immediately, you're like, yes, you know, you're, you're focused on that, but, but you know, it's kind of like knocking at the door and then, and then you open it and there's nobody there. They ran away. But what we're used to in our time is the movies and the advertisements capturing our attention and we have lost the art of paying attention. In this moment right now, just like when we're speaking one to another, some, of the, some people for reasons maybe that they have found churches abusive or whatever, but as soon as we sit down after reading the scripture, some people left the room. Oh, their bodies are here. They will rejoin us when we stand for the benediction. And then there's other people like they hear bits and pieces. But then the bits and pieces stir up an old memory. And then they've got an internal movie going on. And then that leads them to another place. And then that leads them to yet another place. And then something strange happens on the platform and they're back with us again. And all of us do that to some extent in different ways and at different levels. Here's, it's 2016, and our Christchurch theme of the year is, as you will see on your bulletin, Henani. Now, we've got it written like English readers read it, from the right to the left, instead of like Hebrew writes it, from the left to the right. But now you know something about Hebrew letters. Hine means here. And ani means I. So it's I am here. It means presence. But in the Bible, it's used like the old English translations have behold. I think our translators have done us a great disservice in translating that as look here or look or see. No. To behold means to hold one's being at attention. To behold the beauty of the Lord is to be captured by, focused on, nearly entranced by what is before you. When you say hen and e to God, it means I am fully present. I am beholding you. You have my full attention. 
I'm thinking of nothing else. I'm not moving until I hear what you have to say. In Genesis 22, God says, Abraham! And Abraham responds, Hanani. And the Lord says, take your only son, Isaac. And the rest of the story follows. In Exodus 3, Moses comes to the burning bush. And a voice comes out of the burning bush. And Moses, with all of his faults, says, Hanani. All the way through the Old Testament, you see this with people of all kinds of really flawed characters. But what, has, what they have in common is this ability to say, I am listening, you have my full attention, you can count on me to do what I'm asked to do. There's an exception, and it's in Genesis 3. And God calls to, Ab to Adam, Adam! And Adam says, I'm naked. It's about him, you see. I'd like to pay attention to you, Lord, but I still got this nasty habit I'm dealing with. I'd like to be a holy person, but, you know, frankly, I'm mostly not interested. But I kind of don't want to go to hell either, so kind of like caught, kind of like not sure. I would like to be used by you, but I've done some really bad stuff. And when people find out all that I've done, they're not going to like me. Church people, they don't do things like this. Church people are like just pure like the driven snow. Their thoughts are constantly on the things of God, and they are intensely holy. Me, I'm too flawed. You think, well, man, that'll work. No. No. God doesn't ask you to straighten up before you pay attention. You can't pay it, you cannot straighten up until you pay attention. So the first response to God is, I am here. In John chapter 2, which is a gospel reading for the day, the Lord's parents miss him, and they're already on their way back to Nazareth, and probably it's a caravan, they think he's with his relatives or something. And then, then they, look, they, look, they have to go all the way back to Jerusalem and they look around frantically. Three days pass and they find him in the temple uh, speaking with the elders and the rabbis, asking questions, uh, speaking things that are amazing them, the, his provocative questions at that age. And he's amazed that his parents wouldn't know where to find him. And, and it looks like to me like the Lord is saying, well, you know, I'm always paying attention to things of God. Wouldn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? Wouldn't you know that's where I would be? That's, this is what I love to do. And so his parents have this not quite, not quite grasp who he is and what he's about. But the Bible says that he goes with them and he is subject to them and he grows in stature and in favor with God and with men. So we see the Lord already at that age intently connected to the things of God. Now, I've got to wrap this up. Everyone here has a life. You have jobs. You have family. We're not nuns or monks. Sometimes we feel like when we're asked to do, you know, be spiritually minded. Like to my granddaughter in the third grade, she's, um, her teacher was telling her that she didn't get in all her homework. And my granddaughter said to her teacher, you know, I really have a life outside this school. Which is amusing, but it wasn't to her teacher. <laughs> so her parents is like, are you, what are, you, are you kidding? And she said, what? I'm just saying that when I leave school, I have other things to do. Uh, and so understand that. We're kind of like that with God. But our jobs and families are not other than our life in God. We are appointed by God to those things. And we have to ask what sort of godly attention to our vocation and to our family we are giving. 2016, we'll be talking about this all through the year, is the year of hen and e. I am here. I am holding my being at attention. Here, we'll finish here. In the daily office yesterday, I read Psalm 34. What man is it who desires life and covets many days, that he may enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 
And the epistle reading was Ephesians 4. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If we want to experience good days, as the psalm says, we've got to learn to behold God, to say to him, hen and e, and to hear him say back to us, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. And we have to pay attention to others, to our loved ones and friends, of course. We have to learn to shut the noises off and, cu- and shut the phones off. Almost never should the phone take precedence over a living person that is with us. Texting on a phone when we're talking to someone else is, is rudeness and says to that person, you do not matter much to me. This all requires us to pay attention, to listen to opinions that we don't agree with, with respect, to try to understand those opinions, even when it's not reciprocated and the person is not listening to ours. It's rough. And practicing our faith in this way is a matter of paying attention to others, to God, to the things of God, to our own dreams and fears and lifting all of this up to God. So in 2016, let this congregation say to the Lord, I am here. And to one another, I am here. You can count on me. I will give my time. I will give my energy. I will give my attention. And as God allows me and prospers me, and appropriately, I will give of my finances, which is kind of a token of my attention. I want to be present. Um, If you'll give me two or three more minutes here. Some years ago, many, many years ago now, I was pastoring in Phoenix, and uh, for numbers of reasons, uh, I... I went to a clinic for a week, and, um, and, and I began to know things about myself that I had been hiding from myself for a long, long time, uh, and we all do this. Um, I have an image of myself in my head that I truly wish you to share, and I do all I can to propagate and advertise that image the best I can. Um, but then there comes the situations in life that breaks through that image and destroys it, and that's the grace of God when that occurs, though it doesn't feel like it at the time. So I told the people, uh, you know, at the church, and I said, you know, one of those things is sometimes I, I get in a zone, particularly on Sundays, it's the worst time to meet people, and it is the time I meet people. Because I'm focused on my sermon, and I'm trying to think about how, to, how the sermon's going to work. And that's like, and, and you know, people want to tell me about their dog or that they're painting their house. And I've got to listen. And, but the fact is, you see, that that person, at least that person, is likely to take away more the, the fact that I paid attention to what they're feeling about their dog than anything I said in the sermon which is very difficult for me to accept. Because my sermon, I've worked hours over. I, I didn't expect a story about the dog. I don't have a template to, to focus on the dog. So I told them, I said, here's the exercise I will do. Because you know, in therapy, many times they, had cu- they have couples and they'll say, say what you're gonna say and then I want you to repeat back what you think you heard her say. Now you gotta have a therapist when you do this. Don't try to do it by yourself, someone will get hurt. So you say, well, you know, I mean, you know, you said such and such and such and such. I didn't say that at all. So like, oh, that's okay. Rephrase what you just said. Now, what do you think, you know, she said? And, and so you get there eventually like, ah, oh, I hear you saying that like, I don't pay attention to you, that I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Is, is that what you said? Yes. Thank you, George. You paid attention. So I told them, you know, if I am not paying attention to you, you you have a right to say, hey, are you paying attention to me? And I even told them, you can ask me, what did I just get through saying? Uh, Which is really dangerous. But the deal is, most of us have to learn how to enter more deeply 
into the experience of the other that is before us. If someone's telling me, particularly a child, now I will try to listen. A child tells me, my dog is sick. The proper response is, oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll pray for your dog. Do you have a vet? Yeah, he doesn't like going to a vet. No, I bet he doesn't. And you enter into it. A child forever will remember being honored and respected as a person. God has done that to us. When we say to him, Lord, so-and-so didn't pay me attention. They didn't even shake my hand. I'm really upset about that. God doesn't say, Whoops! Straighten up! You think life's about you? No. Lord is compassionate, understands where we're at. Yeah. I was rejected too. Understand that. Be gracious. Be kind. You don't know what they're going through. The Lord bends down to us. And particularly, we have to do that to one another. None of us are as mature as we think we are. We're all in need of grace. We're all in need of being heard. All of us. And we start learning to hear others by listening to God and paying attention to Him. Hen and E. I am here. Well, we're ending today, but we're going to have prayer for those of us that are going to Israel this week. And I'm going to ask, if you will, this is our closing moment, if you'll just stay with us for this prayer. I'm going to ask all of you that are going, this is a pilgrimage. This is, we're going to do our best to try to experience what God would have us to experience in Israel together. And then to come and share with you what we believe that we have heard from the Lord on this. So I'm going to ask Pastor Colleen, if she will, to pray with us. And then Hunter will dismiss us in prayer. Would you guys just extend your hands forward to these that are going? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this moment. Lord, we thank you for these words that we've heard. Lord, we thank you for this group of people that are standing before us. Lord, we thank you for your word that says, we sung it this morning, that you go before us and you come behind us. Lord, you've already gone before this group as they head to the, on this pilgrimage. Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you provide safety and you protect, provide protection for them as they go. Lord, we pray for the vehicles and the transportation and the, and the spaces that they'll lay their head at night. Lord, that you will surround those spaces. There'll be a hedge of protection that you'll surround it with angels. Lord, we pray for their family members and their homes and their, their jobs as the, that they leave, Lord, as they head out to spend more time with you and to learn about you more deeply and to walk in the places that you walk. Lord, that you would protect them as well. Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will give them the ability to be caught up in the in the wonder of this journey, Lord, but then also to be very mindful to be to be able to pay attention to the still small voices and in the subtle ways that you want to speak to them, that you want to enhance their knowledge of you, their relationship with you, Lord Jesus, and so that they can bring that back to us as a community and they can share that with us, Lord. We pray that, th that, that this would be something that will enlighten them and expand them and bring them joy and peace and understanding in ways that, that this trip, without this trip, it wouldn't have been possible, Lord. Lord, we pray for divine appointments. Lord, we pray for, for um, wisdom. We pray for understanding. We pray also, Lord, that whatever their shadow touches while they're in that place, Lord, that it will bring, your, will bring glory to you and that others will be drawn to them, that they, that they will have divine appointments, Lord, that they will be able to share with others and that they too will be able to grow in you. Lord, we thank you for opportunities such as this. We thank you for the provision that you've made so that they can go on this journey, Lord. Bless it. Be glorified by it, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand with us? If you're here visiting with us this morning or you've been a member here for hundreds of years, um, 
I guess that's not possible. I shouldn't have said that. 66 years. Um, we have in the foyer a team every week at a station called Exploring the Christian Faith. And, and what that's about is if you're here and you've sung something, felt something, sensed something, prayed something, heard something that has stirred your spirit to, to press deeper into a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's a team ready to pray with you, speak with you, answer questions, walk this journey with you. So don't leave today without seeing them at Exploring the Christian Faith in the foyer. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he bless you and keep you in all the ways that you can receive blessing in all the ways that you need to be kept. May the Lord cause his face to shine down on you and may you feel his face shining down on you. May the Lord be gracious to you in every way. May be, he be so tender and gentle and gracious and kind and good to you. May the Lord lift up every part of your body and every part of your spirit and every part of your soul that is bent low and sick and crushed down and bruised. May he lift it up and lift up your countenance. And may he fill you this year and today and every day of the year with all of his peace that passes all understanding and can never be taken away. And may he do this throughout all the ages of ages, forever and ever, until we reach his presence forevermore with all of those who we love. God bless you. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.